io9 presents the geek's guide to the galaxy and here are your hosts john joseph adams and david bar curtly hello and welcome to episode 41 of geek's guide to the galaxy Hi, this is John Joseph Adams. I'm the editor of several anthologies. Uh, my latest anthologies are Brave New Worlds and The Way of the Wizard. I have a couple new anthologies coming out soon. Uh, the first in November is uh, the Lightspeed Year One anthology. Then in February, I have Under the Moons of Mars, um, which is an anthology of Barsoom stories based on the work of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Uh, and then in March, I have Armored, which is uh, an anthology of power armor stories. And I'm David Bar Curley. I'm the author of many short stories, including The Disciple, about a student who studies black magic at a New England university. The story originally appeared in Weird Tales magazine, and will be appearing in November in the anthology New Cthulhu, which collects some of the best Lovecraftian fiction of the past decade. And our guest today is Daniel H. Wilson. He's the author of the pop science books How to Survive a Robot Uprising, Where's My Jetpack, and The Mad Scientist Hall of Fame. He's the resident roboticist for Popular Mechanics, and was the host of the History Channel show The Works. His first two novels, A Boy and His Bot and Robopocalypse, came out earlier this year, and Robopocalypse is currently being adapted for film, with Steven Spielberg slated to direct. All right, well, let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Daniel H. Wilson. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Okay, so first of all, just uh, how did you get interested in robots, and did reading science fiction play a role in that? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I grew up reading lots of science fiction. My uh, my dad, we kind of had like a weekly routine where we would go, he's a swimmer, we'd go swimming like every Saturday at the Y, and then we'd go to 3B's used bookstore in Tulsa, <laughs> where I grew up. And I would just, you know, take the books from the week before and trade them in for new books. And I just read basically anything I could get my hands on. And you know, there are a lot of robot, robots in that. And, you know, when I got a little older, uh, I studied computer science. And during an undergraduate degree in computer science, I kind of discovered, first thing I discovered was genetic algorithms. And then um, on a bigger scale, I, I found out about artificial intelligence and machine learning. And from there, decided that that was just about the coolest thing uh, ever. And that <laughs> it was pretty amazing that you could really study that stuff for, for real and for a living. And so then I went to grad school for robotics. Yeah, so I mean, could you tell us a little bit more about that? I mean, when you're doing a degree in robotics, like what, what are the courses and what sort of projects do you do? Yeah, well, robotics is a huge field. And, and I went to Carnegie Mellon where they have a robot institute that is um, it's inside the School of Computer Science. And so with robotics, I mean, you can specialize in all kinds of stuff. You can be the electrical engineer sort of person that really builds uh, the intelligence into the physical form of your robot, like building really efficient legs and things like that. Or you can just do the math, you know, the, the artificial intelligence and the brains. And, and that's really where I, my research was at. So my, my thesis topic was about building smart environments that are able to monitor uh, elderly occupants um, in order to keep track of their functional decline over time uh, so that, you know, you can basically keep track of, of how well they're doing and, and know when they need help, when, when the person needs someone to come clean or stuff like that. So I focused mostly on math and artificial intelligence uh, over the years. But, you know, your initial coursework includes st tons of statistics, tons of math, but also, you know, aut autonomous multi-robot systems and uh, kinematics and, and me mechanics of manipulation and uh, I mean, geez, uh, tons of AI, tons of machine learning, you know, just just mostly the brains and the brawn. Uh, so your first book was called uh, How to Survive a Robot Uprising. Uh, what are a few basic survival strategies when facing off with robots? So I think, you know, the basics are go for the sensors. Um, they're usually the most vulnerable and exposed parts of a machine. And uh, if the machine loses those parts, then it can be very difficult for it to continue functioning. And I think the other thing is just to uh, to understand robotics and understand robots and how they work. And, uh, you know, once you get into the mind of the robot, it's a lot easier to uh, figure out how to defeat your foe. Of course, I don't um, I don't really think robots are going to kill anybody. And, and I and I only use how to survive a robot uprising as sort of a painless uh, delivery method for knowledge about robots and robotics. 
Uh, so robot uprisings are obviously a classic theme in science fiction. Uh, what does your new book, uh, Robopocalypse, do that's new and different with that theme? Well, you know, I feel like I just I have a lot of respect for robots, you know. So <laughs> I, I, t- I try as much as possible to to pay attention to how this would work from the robot's perspective and without a lot of, you know, that sort of inherent human narcissism <laughs> that comes where we think – Oh, obviously, any artificial intelligence would be totally consumed with either destroying humanity or uh, emulating humanity. You know, it's either Data or Terminator. And, and you know, you see that a lot. And, and I think that that's fine because that's what people are interested in. We're interested in people, really. And, and robots are kind of a warped reflection of, of ourselves. But looking at this from, you know, like a roboticist perspective... Uh, I had a lot of fun with Arcos, the the big bad AI behind this, and you know his origins are are fairly standard. It's the singularity type scenario, but what happens after that? You know, I tried to take it to a, a unique place, and so Arcos has pretty complex goals, and and one of the main things that Arcos figures out quickly is that life is really important, and that if you look around, there's not a lot of it, and there's no guarantee that there's any more out there, and that. Uh, there's just so much information locked up in the in the DNA and the patterns and the behaviors and everything that's that's in that's in, in part of life. So it starts to preserve life a little bit. And there's not really a complete environmentalist message there. I'm not, you know, prescriptively trying to tell people that that we should save the earth or anything. But I think that's what an AI would be interested in. I think it would be interested in preserving life and figuring out, you know, how it works. The other thing that Arcos does is uh, by the time you get to the end of the book, you start to realize, because I'm not really in your face explicit about what Arcos is planning. You know, he's the bad guy. There's no point at which he just tells you what he's doing. Um, But what you start to realize is that Arcos is interested in creating a scenario in which human beings and sentient robots are living side by side as equals. And human beings don't just give each other human rights. Typically, humans have to fight in order – they have to fight each other in order to earn human rights. And either that or they have to show that they're, that they're completely crucial and necessary uh, in order to earn human rights. And I'm talking about all the rights movements that have, that have ever happened, and there have been many. And there are many that are ongoing now and, and will be in the future too. Uh, so Arcos realizes that in order to earn a place at the table with humans, uh, it's going to require – you know, it's going to require a fight um, and a demonstration of the fact that these machines are uh, are at least are equals. So to, to what extent are the robot designs in the book based on things that actually exist? And uh, how much of it did you just dream up yourself? Well, I started out in the near future. So it's a, a lot of it's extrapolated from stuff I've experienced. I mean, I've ridden, I've had the really fun opportunity to, for instance, ride in the back of an autonomous vehicle at Carnegie Mellon um, while it's while it's driving and just seeing the steering wheel twist back and forth with nobody in the driver's seat. I've worn uh, the exoskeleton at uh, Berkeley Bionics. You know, I've had a chance to interact with a lot of this technology. And so, you know, this book starts out in the near future and, and the technology that turns on us is very familiar technology. The, you know, there's not enough missiles in the world to kill everybody. This isn't a military thing. This is about the technology that we use every day stopping and then actively turning against us. So, you know, people are getting misleading um, phone calls from text-to-speech, uh, you know, what turns out to be text-to-speech synthesis um, and claiming to be, you know, your family. And and so the, the machine is really manipulating people into very dangerous situations. Cars are just driving off cliffs, things like that, driving into the ocean. So all the initial round of technology is really based on what we have. From there, it gets more complicated, and the machine starts evolving in its own ways. And one thing that I took to heart while writing this was I don't want to explain everything to the, to the reader, you know? Sometimes when you're telling it from the perspective of your character, the character doesn't know what's happening or, or what else is out there, you know? And so you're really catching glimpses of this big, complicated, chaotic world, and all the machines are constantly evolving. So you, even if you see the same machine twice – if you're seeing it later on in the book, you're probably seeing a, a more evolved version that, that's different than the one before. So I really tried to focus on making a big, complicated, constantly evolving ecosystem of robots. 
Could you talk about the the, the sort of unarmed military android? Uh, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I had a great time uh, writing that chapter. So there's something called a safety and pacification unit that is uh, active in Afghanistan in a peacekeeping role uh, during the beginning of the book before any of the robots have, have really gone nuts. And I'm not that interested in, in military robotics. I mean, they're just typically mobile guns, you know, and, and that's the best way to, to kill people. You know, that's probably the best solution to that problem. Uh, so I find that kind of boring. And what I really wanted to think of is how would you ever have a humanoid robot in a military domain? Uh, and the, the only reason to have a humanoid robot, in my perspective, is to take advantage of what the humanoid form factor gives you, which is uh, you have a, a great interface to other human beings, and you have a platform that's really well suited to operating in a human environment because it's going to be able to walk through doors and sit down in vehicles and use our tools and things like that. So from that perspective, I thought to myself, well, really the only time you'd ever see a humanoid robot in a military situation would be if it were playing the role of a uh, sentry, sort of a mobile peacekeeper that's just walking around obeying local customs, speaking the local language, memorizing faces, greeting people, becoming part of the community, and just really being there as a sentinel to, to uh, observe only if something bad is happening and to, uh, if necessary, call in the, the real troops. And so, that, you know, that's what happened, and that's, that's the, uh, the sort of platform that I described. And, you know, I, I'm actually pretty curious what people think about that. Well, it was funny how the kids sort of uh, spray painted and you know, hit it with rocks and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I absolutely think that that kind of stuff will happen. I mean, so back in the United States in the book, people have started to have domestic robots, right? So uh, they domestic humanoid robots that like a butler that you could send up the street. And thinking about that in a really realistic sense, especially with with DreamWorks also uh, creating illustrations of, of what I was writing while I was writing it, you realize, like, this is a real consumer product, you know? I mean, I mean you can't sell somebody a toaster that's going to, like, accidentally burn them or kill them or something. So you also have to make these humanoid robots very safe. And, you know, if they're going to go in public, they're going to have to have license plates on the back, you know? And if they're going to be interacting with people, then people are going to, you know put graffiti on them. And depending on the neighborhood where it walks, you know, someone might try to steal it or, or put a sticker on it or spray paint it or shove it around or uh, shove it out of the elevator because they don't want to be in an elevator with a robot or cut in front of it in line. I mean, just thinking about all the social interactions and, that people, dirty, grimy, everyday people are going to have with uh, humanoid robots, was, that was totally fun for me to think of that stuff. And, and also, I've had those experiences a little bit at Carnegie Mellon where you do interact with robots socially because there are robots walking down the halls <laughs> and rolling into the elevator with you and, uh, you know, sitting at the front of the buildings as, uh, like, the robo-receptionist does um, in <laughs> Newell Simon Hall. So, you know, to be able to put some of that in there was very fun. Okay, so, you know, it's, it's revealed in the first chapter of Robopocalypse that... Uh that humanity will prevail in the end. Uh, Why did you decide to tell the story that way, and what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of that approach? Well, I mean, when you're reading, do you really think that I'm going to kill every single human being on the planet? The thing is, Arcos is not fucking interested in that at all. That's To me, that's just like, that's lame. Like, when I try to think about, you know, like, what are you going to do, Skynet, whenever mm -hmm. you've killed every single human being? How pathetic, Right. You're a super intelligent AI, and all you want to do is kill every single human being, and you've geared your entire existence toward that one end? What kind of goal is that? I mean, it's just lame, and it's beneath my idea of what robots can be and what they should be. So there's never a question that every single human being is going to be killed. And in fact, I think like in the fifth chapter or something, Arcos tells a guy, I guarantee you that humanity will live. My goal is not to kill every human being. You know, I mean, here's the deal. People, and I knew this going in, people knowing that this is a robot uprising story have preconceived ideas about what your AI, what your bad guy's goals are and things like that. And I wanted to take advantage of that because I wanted people to be able to hit the ground running and know what they were getting into and, and enjoy this, you know, because if, 
if you want to read Robopocalypse or not, like you know it. <laughs> the title, right? If you're not interested in that, then then you're going to keep walking. I'm not fooling anybody, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, by taking advantage of, of of this existing meme, I think that people can come in and get what they're expecting. But the problem is also the drawback of that is that you know the, their expectations are really set in stone to the extent that I think it actually overrides some of what they're actually reading. You know? So if I could do it again, I might go back and make it more emphatic that that Arcos is not intending to kill every human and that there, you know, there are these differences um, between your traditional robot uprising story. So um, by starting at the end, I don't think I give that much away. You know, the human beings are going to live through this. I don't want people worried that the human beings aren't going to live through this. What sh the, the real question is, which human beings are going to live through this? And what's going to happen to them along the way? And, and, you know, by the time you're into the book, ideally, if I've, you know, done anything right, you're going to care about, you know, some of these people and, and how things are going to end up for them. Um, it's really hard to focus on a billion people and, uh, and care too much in a book about whether they're all going to live or die. Okay, so and, and how and when did you get the idea to give the Osage Nation such a prominent role in the story? I, you know, grew up in Oklahoma and I was, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit Cherokee like everybody in Oklahoma. Uh, and I grew up in the Cherokee Nation and, you know, you, you vote, you have, you know, Cherokee license plates and stuff like that. But it's not a reservation or anything like that. It's just a government that's superimposed on top of the United States government. And so for a long time, I'd had this idea for a story where the United States government fell apart and tribal governments stuck together because they're smaller and more agile. And so I realized pretty quickly that this is the, the perfect port for, for some of those ideas and that um, I could really explore some themes that I really was interested in, like uh, you know, coming of age, becoming a man in a tribal culture, in a tribal warrior culture, uh, you know, in a situation where you really do have an enemy and there really is an other to focus on. So that was all stuff I had thought of and then realized would, would really fit perfectly in the whole Robopocalypse world. Plus cowboys and robots, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> man, I love that stuff. I love like cowboy sharpshooters riding on top of legged robots uh, through the tall prairie grass. Jeez, man. I mean, some of the scenes were just in my head and I just really wanted to go there. Uh, so you mentioned DreamWorks earlier. Uh, uh, the book was actually bought for film before it was even finished. Uh, how did that come about, and how did that affect your writing process? So it was it was optioned. You know, I mean, there's a big difference between the the film rights being bought and and them being optioned. So that happened the day before I sold the book to a publisher. So DreamWorks called and said, you know, we've gotten someone leaked a, a sample of this to us, and we're really interested in it, and we'd like to buy it today, please. And uh, that never happens, you know. So they, my my people, kind of knew that Spielberg had to be behind it, because there's nobody else really that can um, that can drive that kind of deal and make it go so fast. Because, I mean, if you think about it, these managers who are my manager in in L.A. and like they're selling these, uh, you know, all these different properties, but they have personal relationships with all the studios. And to just have to let one studio swoop in and take it off the table before you even show it to another studio is a big bummer like it makes the other studios not happy and so for that to, for that to happen we knew that there was you know an 800 pound gorilla somewhere involved and uh you know the next week i did find out that it, that it was spielberg and i went out there and and met everybody and we talked robots for hours like all afternoon i mean just completely surreal and what happened was right off the bat i met drew goddard who's the screenwriter uh, and I met Stephen, and we all talked about, you know, what we loved and what we didn't like and, you know, what we thought was most promising about the, the book. And I had an annotated table of contents, but I only had 100 pages of the thing written. So there's a little pressure to, <laughs> to write a good book. Um, but, but I didn't really feel it because it was so obvious that, that he was really into it. He said something like, oh, you know, this, this could be something like this could be Saving Private Ryan with robots, you know. <laughs> And I'm just thinking, this is going to be the coolest freaking movie ever, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, I had that meeting. And that's the only time that I've, you know, met with them. It's not like we're best friends or anything, but I really appreciated that. And afterwards, I ended up talking to Drew quite a bit. And, and Drew was saying stuff like, hey, Daniel, 
I really could use the next hundred pages on RoboPocalypse <laughs> uh, because I'm already writing the screenplay and I don't have anything except this hundred pages in your table of contents, mm -hmm. which is changing. And also Steven is making stuff up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> The sooner you come up with something, you know, the, the sooner, the more of this is going to be from your book. So, and then he would also, when I would give him stuff, he would say, okay, but you know, why, and how is this working? And you know, he's a, he's a storyteller just like I am. And just having to explain, you know, my reasoning behind what was happening uh, in the story as I, as it unfolded and as I wrote it, uh, you know, that was hugely valuable for me uh, because Drew a, really wanted the stuff, so that was driving me to write fast, and B, was really pushing me about whether it made sense and what the logic was and uh, just basic logistical stuff. And, you know, I mean, because he had to write it too. And so, you know, he wanted to get some problems solved up front. I mean, it was a great process. And, and that was just the, the writing process. They were also making artwork this whole time. And so... I was in a position where Guy Dias, who's the production designer, who was just up for an Oscar for uh, Inception, I mean, clearly a genius, this guy had a team that's been illustrating uh, sequences and things and doing pre for a long time. Jeez, the whole time I was writing. And he would ask me, you know, hey, you're big happy. Uh, you know, what does it look like? Uh, more specifically, what does it look like? And, and why does it operate this way? And, you know, and he would just going into super detail about the locations, the the scenery, because he's having to really draw it, you know? And so I found that a lot of times in a place where I would have just sketched a bare bones idea of where we were at, you know, after talking to Guy, I would go back and he'd ask me, and of course I'd make it up off the top of my head and be like, oh, Guy, that's very simple. It would be like this. And then I'd create this whole, all this imagery, and then I'd go back and add it all in. You know, it's because I just had to sort of explain it and, and sort of show my work, you know. <laughs> the book contains a strong horror element. Uh, did you intentionally set out to make it read like a horror novel? And if so, are there, are there any particular horror writers who influence you? You know, I didn't set out to make it uh, a horror novel. Um, and, and I didn't, I don't really read a lot of horror. I mean, I read Lovecraft and, and stuff like that, but I, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not particularly huge into the the horror genre so what i found was just that at the beginning of the book especially things needed to be psychological in order to make things tense and scary it wasn't about huge monster robots at that point because there couldn't be any they didn't they hadn't had time to evolve yet and uh you know i wanted to make sure that the whole thing was just completely consistent you know i wasn't going to throw in big robots where they didn't belong and so, you know, I had to rely on, uh, on, on other means of amping up the tension early on in the book. And, and that's kind of a pet peeve of mine, actually, that I'll, I'll go off on, on now, if that's okay. Um, you know, when you, when you think about horror components that appear in sci-fi, I think sometimes people depend on old horror standbys uh, instead of actually honoring the sci-fi. And, and one example that kind of kills me First of all, I love Terminator. I love all the Terminators. Um, I love them all, actually, which, you know, judge me. But uh, one thing that I've never been able to get over is the fact that the Terminator loves to stalk over to whoever it's – this is all models of Terminator do this. They stalk over to their prey. Then instead of just just picking up whoever it is they're trying to kill and just crushing them, just – I mean, they're immensely strong. They punch them really hard and make them go flying across the room. Hmm. Or they throw them across the room. Why are you going to do this? You're a robot. Like your goal is to destroy your prey. You don't throw the prey further away from you. But the reason they're doing it is so they can stalk toward the prey again slowly to create drama. But that's a horror convention. That's what Jason does. That's what Freddy does. That's not what a robot would do. So uh, to me, it seems like a situation where filmmakers have allowed a convention from horror to overshadow what should be something that honors the the sort of sci-fi logical consistency of the world in which, you know, that would never happen. And yeah, it is dramatic when the Terminator is walking towards someone that's crawling away as fast as they can and they're injured and bloody and everything. But you know what? No, it would never happen. And so I've always kind of hated that. And so while writing Robo Apocalypse, I really tried to always 
honor the consistency of the world and never use uh, conventions that were handy, uh, even though you know they might, even though they don't make sense. Uh, actually, in, in Terminator, there's a memorable scene where uh, the humans are fleeing through a factory, and, and one of them turns on all this equipment so that the robot will be confused by all the motion. Would that actually work uh, against a robot, or would a, would a robot's pattern recognition stuff be able to distinguish between different kinds of motion like that? I think that would absolutely work. I mean, that's a great idea. Decoys. One thing that's really hard for robots is context. So, for instance, if you throw a bowling ball at a robot or you throw a balloon at a robot, just from looking at this round object flying through the air, uh, you know, the robot doesn't probably have the, con the full context of knowing about bowling alleys and knowing about birthday parties. And it just sees an object coming. And therefore, if it's going to play it safe, the robot will probably assume the worst and assume that, you know, it's a bowling ball. And so by creating sort of distractions like that, I think that, uh, you know, you can really hogtie a robot that has no context for what all of these new stimuli, stimuli really are. Okay, so, you know, the, the robots in Robopocalypse are led by a superhumanly intelligent AI. Uh, what's it like trying to write a character who's smarter than you are? And was it challenging to imagine how humanity might prevail against such a formidable opponent? Yeah, I mean, that was really hard. And, and it was really fun, too. I mean, you have to leave a lot to the imagination with that. Um, I, I ended up listening a lot to Symphony of Science, you know, the, all those songs that they've come out with, with the, yeah, yeah. With the Sagan quotes and the, and the Tyson quotes. And, and that's my mind space for Arcos. Listening to those sort of dreamy songs and thinking about the scale of the universe. And that's kind of how I feel like Arcos feels. You know, when you look up at the night sky and you see all the stars, uh, in the middle of the night, if you're in the country and you just suddenly get that, the back of your throat sort of, you know, swells up and you just feel so small and overwhelmed by the universe. I mean, I think that's how Arcos feels all the time because Arcos really does, in an intellectual way that we can't fathom, Arcos really grasps the size of the universe and the amount of knowledge and the, the number of galaxies and, and rocks and light and energy and that's just spinning all the time and moving forward. And so, you know, writing from that perspective and then having that character sort of try to interact with human beings, you know, it is really definitely a challenge. I mean, people do it. You know, people write Hannibal Lecter. They write Sherlock Holmes. And people constantly write characters that are smarter than any of us, including the writer. And, and so it's not, you know, a unique challenge necessarily. But I had a lot of fun doing it, you know. And, and ultimately, Arcos, I think, is so smart that I don't think, you know, me personally, everybody can have their own in interpretation of the book. But when that book ends, Arcos got exactly what he wanted. I don't think it's possible to outwit Arcos. Um, so, I mean, you mentioned earlier that you're not that worried about robots uprising. I mean, why, uh, why is that something that doesn't really concern you? And uh, are you familiar with organizations like the Singularity Institute that are sort of focusing attention on that issue? Yeah, no, I'm familiar with all with the Singularity Institute and, and uh, the, the people that are interested in creating friendly AI and, uh, and stuff like that. And the thing is, I'm, uh, I'm not worried about the Singularity happening anytime soon which precludes, uh, automatically precludes a lot of that stuff. What I am interested in, though, is obviously people building safe tools, safe robots. And, and robots are really complicated, you know, especially if, when they're really autonomous and multipurpose. You know, it's fairly easy to make sure that a very single-purpose product kind of does its one job and doesn't screw up because you have a very constrained environment for it, you know. I mean... If you're designing a, you know, I don't know, a razor for someone to shave their face, well, yeah, that could be dangerous. But you know it's, it's going to be used in a bathroom, and you know, like, what it's going to be used for and the situations that you're going to have. And so you can kind of, you know, plan for that. But a humanoid robot that just walks down the street, I mean, imagine how complex that is and behavior that's autonomous. You're not going to be able to cover all the potential dangerous situations that that machine could be in. It is a huge challenge, I think, to roboticists. And then that's just the physical side, because there's also a whole ethical side that springs into action whenever you've got robots that are autonomous and also robots that look like people or animals, you know? So 
you don't want a generation of kids who are abusing robot dogs that are indistinguishable from real dogs because they're going to get a skewed version of, of how ethics work and it might screw up their empathy. I mean, you could really mess up, you know, a generation of kids if you do this wrong, uh, you know, mentally. And then also when you've got something that's autonomous and it's making decisions on its own and it does something bad, well, who do you blame? You know, and there's, there's all this stuff to work out, you know, from that perspective as well. So it's a hugely complicated problem, I think, to build autonomous tools that are safe. And it's a very concrete problem, and it's a near-term problem that people are solving right now and have solved uh, for all sorts of consumer products for years. And so, you know, but anything as grandiose as building friendly AI so that it won't destroy us when it inevitably comes online and gains superhuman intelligence, nah, that's not something that I think that people should be devoting too much practical thought to, although philosophically it's really interesting. You know, one thing I, I wondered about reading the book is that uh, there are these scenes where um, autonomous cars drive around killing people while the driver is trapped helplessly inside. And it just made me wonder, like, wouldn't those cars be designed so that you could turn off the AI in, in an emergency? You know, maybe maybe they would or maybe they wouldn't. I mean, if you think about autonomous safety features that are in automobiles currently, right now, they, uh, they're all features that operate faster than human beings can think, you know, so you can't, for instance, turn off your analog brakes, you can't turn off your, uh, your seatbelt locking mechanism, you know, that, that tightens your seatbelts uh, before impact. I guess you can turn off your airbags if you want, but probably not all of them since they have started appearing all throughout the car. Um, you know, I think it's arguable. For the purpose of the book, it was obviously those were a main source of mayhem. Um, and so, yeah, maybe a few smart people figured out where they're in their fuse box, the ECU was, you know, and they disabled that. Uh, but I think that about 500 million other people didn't figure that out. <laughs> uh, so one character in Robopocalypse lives with a robot wife. Uh, what do you think about the potential of robots as spouses? And do you think that it ever become commonplace? Well, that's Takeo. And he was a Japanese character, and so I, I felt like culturally he was in a place where it was more likely that uh, he'd be able to get away with something like that without a lot of, uh, without, you know, uh, becoming a total outcast. Human beings routinely have intimate relationships with inanimate objects. We name the things we interact with, we ascribe emotions and, uh, you know, to them, and we talk to them, and there's nothing new about that. And so when you get a, uh, an Android or some sort of machine that actually is intentionally looks like a human being, then I think it just is all too easy to incorporate something like that into your life um, and ascribe, you know, it's a totally anthropomorphize it and, and to the point that you treat it like a completely functioning human and as, uh, you know, the object of your desire. Now, Takeo's wife was not sexually functioning. So she was, it was an emotional relationship that he was having with her. And, and I felt like it was really interesting because she looked like somebody and she didn't look young. She wasn't an anime love doll with, you know, exaggerated features, so to speak. She was, uh, she had gray hair, you know, she looked like a, someone and it makes you think, you know, what's gone wrong in this guy's life that he's alone in an apartment living with a, uh, a, a really beautiful machine that, that looks like somebody who's probably not around anymore. I felt like it made him sympathetic and, and hinted at sort of a traumatic past for him. And also showed that he loves machines emotionally from a relationship perspective. And uh, that made him kind of a unique character and it gave him a unique reaction when all the machines went haywire. Uh, so, uh, what are what are some of your favorite examples of uh, robots, like in in fiction or film? For a breath, I tarry by Roger Zelazny is a short story where there's it's a post human world. All the humans are gone, and there's a uh, there's this machine that's super intelligent that's you know taking care of part of the globe, and these machines are busily taking care of everything. And there's there's this robot in there called. Uh, Frost. This robot, I love it because it becomes fascinated with human beings. And what it does is it eventually transforms itself into a human being just out of fascination, not any desire to 
you know, to worship human ancestors. It's more like a curiosity. And there's this moment when this machine wakes up in a human body and realizes from a human perspective that everybody's dead and that the world is without meaning because human beings give the world meaning by existing. I mean, if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to hear it, then who fucking cares? <laughs> like, I mean, that, I mean, that's kind of my perspective. And, and when he comes online, he just starts screaming because he just realizes the, the despair and the absolute meaninglessness of everything that's happening. And I mean, that crossing that threshold from robot to human, I mean, to me, that's so fascinating. What a, what a fascinating sort of threshold to cross. You know, another robot I really like, I like Agent Smith from The Matrix. He's really interesting to me because he feel, the, the fact that he feels trapped by being around human beings and how he, he doesn't like that we think with meat and he doesn't want to be near us and he wants to sort of go back to this like sort of pure intellectual existence. That I kind of am fascinated with too. Like he's sort of he's sort of living in a post-human world where there's no longer any need to be to have a material body, and he finds the whole idea sort of repugnant. You know, I can relate to that. <laughs> you know, being a human is kind of gross. Uh, so, what are some of the recent developments in robotics that have most impressed you? Well, you know, I like this Watson uh, hmm. machine. I like that. I think that the natural language problem is is the hardest problem to solve in AI. Just having a conversation with people, mainly because you can't get all the context of, of what it means to be a person, and you know how language is. You say one word. I mean, when when you speak, the onus is on the listener, right? The speaker says one word, and then the listener's brain just lights up like a Christmas tree and fills in all the details. You know, so you say tree, and the other person just thinks of all the stuff that has to do with treeness, you know? And for robots to sort of join that party is super exciting because everything else will come in time, but that's the one that it's not clear that we'll ever really get there and have a machine that can just communicate with a person as, a, as another person and, you know, and pass the Turing test and all that stuff. So seeing Watson make a stride forward into, you know, a much more complicated sort of... Uh, speech interaction with human beings. It was really exciting, and I hope that he keeps making progress. Now, I mean, that's kind of boring because he just sort of sits there and answers Jeopardy questions. Um, in terms of just, like, viscerally exciting robots, every new version of the Big Dog <laughs> is, like, from Boston uh, Dynamics. The Big Dog exhibits natural grace, you know, when it walks, and it, it makes you think of living things. And I'm very excited to be around to see robots shed their robotic identity, you know, because kids that are born today, if you say do the robot, they're not going to get it. Mm -hmm. They're going to be like, what are you talking about? Robots are fluid. Robots move smoother than animals. Robots are incredibly precise and graceful. And we, of course, don't think of them that way. But I'm excited for them to... Uh, to come over to our side and start exuding natural grace. Do you think that anybody will ever uh, write a computer program that could write a book as good as Robopocalypse? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a value judgment in there? Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, you know, I absolutely think that, that robots will write books at some point. I, I don't know whether they'll be any good or whether, you know, one thing I'm actually on a related note to this, I'm really looking forward to robots that are going to start editing films together and creating mashups, you know, and I think that it's quite possible that robots could edit books together and create mashups hmm. uh, of that, or at least even find the thread of a character and then rewrite that character, uh, but, you know, change the physical attributes of the character or change the gender and, and, you know, start picking apart what humans have done and then putting it back together in interesting uh, ways that make sense when you read it. Uh, and you see stuff like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and, and things like that. And that's the kind of thing that a human sort of had to do. And I think it's the kind of thing that you'll be able to download an app and it will <laughs> it will do it for you on the fly, probably in the near future. I can't imagine that somebody's not working on that. And I imagine that'll happen for books before it'll happen for uh, for for film. But I think it's going to be really fun, you know? I want to, like, take Stallone and put him into, like, 
every movie and then go back and watch it again. You know, Stallone as Neo, Stallone as, uh, you know, as, as the Arnold and, you know, Predator, stuff like that. Or actually, that's not too big of a leap. <laughs> but, you know, I think that'll be fun in the future. All right. So, you know, you have some short stories coming out in John's anthologies, Armored and The Mad Scientist's Guide to World Domination. Could you tell us about those? You know, so the executor, I'm actually right. I've written a screenplay, like a spec script based on this as well. So I've ended up thinking a lot more about this world. But the executor is about basically a mad scientist who is very wealthy. And he, when he dies, instead of leaving his money to his kids, he actually creates uh, an immortal AI in his own form with his own emotions and his own sort of based on his own personality. And it's called the executor. And so it's, it's the executor to his will. So what happens, though, is over the course of several hundred years, it builds this huge fortune. And everyone who's related to this guy has this opportunity to come in and sort of try to solve the riddle of the Sphinx and claim the, uh, the money. But what happens is you end up with this whole sort of Dune-like dynasty of families that are all potential heirs to billions and billions and trillions of dollars. And so they're all at war with each other uh, and trying to strategically stop each other from being able to make a claim for, the, uh, for this ransom. And so it's the story of a, of a guy who has been on the run for his whole life from his own family because they're bloodthirsty. And then he basically has a daughter who's also an heir. And, and in order to protect her, he has to... Um, try and claim this so that the, the, this sort of prolonged war will end. And it's like Philip Marlowe from the Raymond Chandler, uh, you know, noir uh, books. It, you know, it's a little bit of that. It's a little bit of like Lone Wolf and Cub. Um, <laughs> it's just, you know, some samurai ethos. It's just, it's really fun. I mean, I had a great time with that one. And then, uh, and the other, the other piece is for the Armored Anthology. And, you know, with, with Armored, Power armor is so – you see powered armor, is, is, it's really well represented in, in science fiction, and it almost always is a, 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 you know, doing the same thing. It's making somebody into a super soldier usually. And so I really got to thinking about walls and about you know, the idea of armor separating you from the environment and, and making you stronger. And I really wanted to turn the whole thing on its head sort of thematically. And so in the short story I've written, which is currently called Helmet, you have a situation where there's a guy, there are basically these helmets, these power armored soldiers that come into town and, and kill people, and they're totally faceless, and nobody understands why they're doing it or you know what their motivation is until the protagonist is kidnapped and he's put into a, a helmet against his will, and he realizes that the people inside the helmets are trapped there. They're not able to actually move any part of their bodies except for their faces. And the, the powered armor is moving their limbs for them. And they're part of this government that be basically believes that if you go through the motions of a crime, then you are morally responsible for that crime. So what they do is they have these helmets do all their dirty work, murdering and everything nasty that, that they need to do for their government. and at the end of the day, they execute the helmets, and then they consider that the crimes are punished because these people who are trapped inside the helmets have been punished for the crimes that, they're, that they committed with their bodies. You know, it's just sort of an example of how walls can also control you instead of just protecting you and how uh, an armor with a mind of its own can, can take over your life instead of amplifying your abilities. It actually makes you impotent and completely takes away all of your ability to, to move or to act in the world. And I don't know, it was just, it was a really fun theme. And then finally, just are there any other recent or upcoming projects that you'd like to mention? Well, right now I'm writing uh, AMP for Doubleday and uh, the film rights sold to Summit um, with Alex Proyas sort of tentatively uh, set up to direct. So I should, that should come out next summer and that's about a near-term future uh, where there's a human rights movement because people have started integrating technology into their own bodies and some people are into it and some people aren't. And, you know, I'm really fascinated with like our relationship with technology and how technology keeps moving forward. And we always kind of, since we depend on it so much, we have to keep go moving with it. And this is, I think, is going to be a significant hurdle 
when technology starts coming into our bodies and has to come into our bodies for us to get the benefits from using it. And so I imagine a, a large percentage of people will balk at that, and it will be interesting to see how we get over it. Um, and the other thing I'm doing is I'm writing a, uh, I'm screenwriting a remake of the 80s movie Cherry 2000, <laughs> which is, has been a real hoot. Yeah, that's, a, that's an old 80s movie about a love doll hmm. that a guy lives with. Um, <laughs> it's a kind of a flawed movie, but very fun. And uh, my version is going to be, I think, you know, pretty cool. My, my website's danielhwilson.com, and I'm on Twitter at danielwilsonpdx. And so, yeah, I'd love to hear from people. If they, if they want to ask me questions, they can reach me through those places. All right, well, Daniel H. Wilson, thanks so much for joining us on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Thanks for having me on, guys. And that was our interview. So thanks so much to Daniel H. Wilson for joining us on the show. Okay, and so our uh, discussion topic for today is going to be the Terminator film franchise, uh, which Daniel mentioned uh, during the interview. And uh, I guess, you know, John and I, you know, we we were sort of kids when the first two Terminator movies came out. So I was just kind of wondering, uh, you know, did you see them back then? Uh, Did you like them? Uh, Stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I... I remember the the first Terminator movie is probably one of the first uh, rated R movies that I ever saw. Um, and I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger in general was sort of the the actor, uh, you know, who was sort of the, the star of these action vehicles that uh, first exposed me to the different uh, rated R movies. Uh, I, I mean, I guess I was a little a little sheltered as a kid in, in terms of uh, being exposed to adult content like that. Uh, although, I mean, I, you know. In, in retrospect, it seems that way. But, I mean, I, I'm talking about, like, maybe I was 13 or 14 when I when I saw, you know, this, when I saw Terminator and, and, and these other Arnold Schwarzenegger movies of that era. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly I certainly liked uh, Terminator a lot when I first saw it. And then um, I remember, like, you know, I loved Terminator 2 when it first came out. I mean, that was, like, one of the first big action movies I really remember, um, you know, going to the theater and being blown away by. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm also just a really big fan of, of Terminator and Terminator 2. And I've got, I, you know, I've rewatched those movies countless times. The virtues speak for themselves in terms of the action and the, uh, you know, the special effects and you know, so some of the, a lot of the dialogue is pretty entertaining. But now, I mean, if you, if I think about them now, I sort of, there are a lot of, there are some things that have kind of bugged me, uh, mm-hmm. just about the logic and stuff. And oh, yeah. maybe we, we could talk a little bit, bit about that. I guess, I guess we should say quickly, uh, if you haven't seen, I guess I, we should say that we're, these are, we're going to spoil, we're going to spoil us for these movies. Um, and if it's, uh, if you haven't seen the movies, um, or you haven't seen them for a while and you're, you're a little fuzzy now in Terminator, there's a a future in which evil robots have taken over and they send a robot who looks like a human being back in time to kill the mother of the leader of the human resistance before he's even conceived, uh, in order to win the war. And then, uh, in Terminator two, you've got the, uh, cyborg sent back in time to protect the future leader of the human resistance and another Terminator who's a sort of liquid metal guy is sent to kill him. And then in Terminator 3, there's a liquid metal woman who can shoot laser beams and stuff from her hands, is sent back to kill him again when he's even older. And then uh, Terminator Salvation, it's uh, set in the future in which, uh, you know, humanity is fighting robots. And um, I don't know, let's see, there's this, this guy who's sort of a... <sighs> Uh, he's kind of a Terminator, but he's kind of good too. I don't know. I'm kind of fuzzy. We were, we were talking, actually, John, you know, sent me an email saying that he had rewatched Terminator 2 and Terminator 3 and Terminator 4, but he was already starting to forget 4. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm totally with you on that because I, I really, I don't remember anything about this movie except that it was uh, kind of boring. Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I I, ha- I hadn't seen it until I, so I, I was watching Terminator 4 for the first time and I rewatched the others, but um you know, I, uh, so it was like on Thursday last week, I watched it. And then like, I emailed you on Friday. I was like, literally, it's like literally the next day. It's like, I just watched it. And I already, I'm kind of fuzzy on like, it's like, I didn't take any notes on it. And, and like when I rewatched Terminator 2 and Terminator 3, I was like taking notes cause I was, you know, for the show, but uh, I, you know, I didn't take any when I was watching Terminator 4, but like, man, I wish I had, cause like I, <laughs> like I barely remember anything about it. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean the guy you're talking about, I, I don't, I don't know that I ever actually understood what he was. I mean, he's like, <laughs> Uh, I mean, because they show there's like a scene at the beginning where he's like, you know, he's a convict or something on death row and uh, he donates his body to Cyberdyne for science purposes. And so it's like they like, I don't know, they cloned him or something, but then they made him into a Terminator 
I don't understand. Like, I mean, they, they, or they, they, they downloaded the essence of his brain into a Terminator body or whatever. Cause like, cause he's a Terminator, but he doesn't know that he's a Terminator. He thinks he's human. So, I mean, I guess that was the point of him, you know, that, that, he, that they could, that he could be like a, like a secret agent or something. And you know, like, he, even he doesn't know like a sleeper, like a sleeper agent, I should say. Um, I guess that was the point of him, but like, it doesn't work out very well for Cyberdyne anyway, cause, or, or for, for Skynet or whoever the hell uh, cooked this guy up. Uh, Cause you know, he, he ends up helping the good guys. So. Well, what I've heard was that the plot for this movie was originally supposed to be that um, John Connor was going to die. And in mm-hmm. order to, for the resistance to continue, they were going to cut off his skin and put it on top of a Terminator type <laughs> skeleton. And he was going to, you know, and they're going to pretend he was still alive. Wow. Um, and I guess they, they decided not to do that, but there's still a lot of stuff in the story kind of pointing in that direction. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't know. I just, by the end, I was just, I was just not paying any attention anymore. One, one little detail about four that sort of it, it retroactively applies to the whole series. Um, or I don't remember if they show them in, I, don't, I remember if they show this in the first one, but so like, um, you know, uh, throughout the series, we get these glimpses of the future, you know, the future where the, where the machines have taken over and, and John Connor is the leader of the resistance and all that. So we've seen glimpses of that in the, in, in, in at least two and three. And then in four, the whole movie takes place in that setting. But so you, we see John Connor, and, and like in two, like we see an actor portraying him, and, he, and you know, he's got these scars on his face and everything. And then in three, with these, there's a different guy portraying him, but he's got the same scars. But so it was kind of cool because like in, in four, they actually show him get those scars. Uh, like they show, I think it was like a Terminator or something, like sort of you know attacking him, and so like you actually see the scars. All right, but so yeah, so let's get back to the first Terminator. So yeah, uh, I was going to say one thing that's always kind of bugged me about this movie is that. Um, so the term, you know, the Terminator has gone back in time and is hunting Sarah Connor and is knocking off all the Sarah Connors in the phone book. And so, so she's getting kind of freaked out and there's this sort of uh, weird looking guy following her around. Uh, so she goes into a nightclub and, uh, it turns out that the, and then the Terminator comes in to get her. And then it turns out that the weird looking guy is actually the guy who's been sent back in time to protect her. You know, so, so the Terminator, you know, points a gun at her head and has a, you know, a red dot on her forehead. And, and that's the moment that her protector leaps out with a shotgun and starts blasting the Terminator. And he later explains that he had to wait until the Terminator made a move on, on her so that he could identify him. And this has always kind of bugged me. It just (laughs) seems like way too big a risk to take, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. wouldn't it be better to just get her to safety and not worry about whether you can identify the Terminator or not, seeing as she Mm -hmm. almost dies like six times in rapid succession in that scene (laughs) sequence. Um, and actually, it seems like that model of Terminator is actually pretty prevalent. So, like, shouldn't he have known that that's what the Terminators look like? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like, it's not at all clear to me in Terminator why they only sent one person back to, to, protect, pr- to her? protect her. That that was always something that, as a kid, I, I always wondered about, you know, why not just send a whole platoon back or something, you know? Mm-hmm. Or why not send them back to the week before the Terminator and, you know, mm-hmm. get her to safety? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, true, true. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. We don't know. We don't know anything about the mechanics of their time travel technology, right? So, I mean, it's hard to say. But, uh, but yeah, it does seem a little questionable. Um, and I'm not actually even under, sure I understand how this how this going back in time thing is supposed to help them anyway, right? Because so, like, if they send this guy back in time to stop something from happening or to change something, it's like then they would have never existed or something, right? Yeah. If well, yeah. If, for example, if they send someone back. Uh, as happens in Terminator 2, and, and that, that person ends up trying to prevent uh, the machines from taking over in the first place, then right. you know, the, all the people who sent them would uh, you know, sort of cease, cease to exist. Although that, that might be a sacrifice that they would consider worth making. Um, yeah, right, right. True, true. Yeah, although that, that doesn't actually seem to be the case, though, since, uh, you know, because by the end of Terminator 2, it looks like they've averted Judgment Day, right? But then in Terminator 3, it, it's revealed that, that, they, that they didn't actually avert it, that they just sort of postponed it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, it seems like the rules of time travel are not at all consistent uh, yeah. between the movies. I mean, Terminator, I think, works pretty well as a, you know, whatever happened, happened. That it's, it's mm-hmm. one of those classic time travel things where you send, you go back in time trying to change the present or the future or whatever, and you just end up creating, you know, no matter what you do, you end up creating, uh, you know, the, the future that you're familiar with um, mm-hmm. because, you know, what happened, happened. Right. Um, but then, they, then in Terminator 2, that's different because, yeah, then they end up... Uh, changing uh what's going to happen mm-hmm. uh so <laughs> it gets it gets very questionable 
And also there's, there's also a big potential for paradox there, just what we were talking about, because since Kyle Reese is from the future and he's sent back in time and then he becomes John Connor's father, but John Connor is the guy who sent him back in time in the first place. So if they, uh, if they do something in the past that changes the future, then John Connor, the John Connor that sent Kyle Reese back in time would have never, never existed. And so how could he, you know, you know what I mean? So it's like paradox. Although I have to say one of my favorite, like probably one of my all time favorite movie lines is, is in Terminator when they're interrogating Kyle Reese and they're asking him, you know, they, they ask him, why didn't you bring back a laser gun with you from the future? Mm -hmm. And he says, well, you know, nothing dead will go. Only living tissue can go. And they mm -hmm. say, well, why is that? And he says, I didn't build a fucking thing. <laughs> and I've always liked that. It's, you know, cause it's, it's totally in character, but it also gets you out of having to provide what would inevitably be an unsatisfying uh, sort of explanation for, for something like that. Right, right. No, I, no, I agree. That's great. And I mean, that's, uh, it's kind of a good lesson to science fiction writers to like say, you know, hey, you know, you don't always have to explain everything. And like, you know, just make sure your protagonist doesn't actually understand how the <laughs> fucking thing would work. And then that way you get out of it. But yeah, I mean, like, like the thing with Reese, you know, waiting until the Terminator has Sarah in his sights before he, he moves, that, that seems to be something that happens a lot in, in Terminator, in the Terminator movies, the, the sort of what I would call an idiot plot contrivance, which is where, you know, the only way to get the plot to do what you want is for the characters to act like complete idiots. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, the, the biggest example of that in Terminator is, is where Sarah uh, calls her mom uh, when she's been explicitly ordered not to and gives her mm -hmm. her, her address. And of course, her mom has already been terminated and the Terminator, mm -hmm. she's actually talking to the Terminator and telling him where they are. But I've, I've always sort of wondered about that, you know, like if she, cause, cause it seems like the Terminator's, their standard operating procedure is to find the family member closest to the target and in, impersonate them. But then I've always wondered, you know, what if the target was actually smart and just didn't, you know, didn't fall for that one? What would the Terminator mm -hmm. do then? Would he just, would he just hang around? Like how long would he hang around Sarah Connor's mom's house? seeing if mm -hmm. she would call. Mm -hmm. um, and especially since he's like blown her door down and, you know, <laughs> killed her. It, it seems like, you know, the neighbors might get suspicious uh, before too long. Right. I mean, it's, it's sort of the same thing in Terminator 2, you know, like uh, cl clearly the, the best strategy for, for John Connor to survive is not to try to rescue his mom from the mental institution, but he mm -hmm. decides to go anyway, which puts them all, you know, right in the sights of the T-1000 who's gone there to try to impersonate her. But yeah, so like, what if he didn't go there at all? Would the T-1000 impersonate Sarah Connor and just hang out there, like, for how long? And what would he try mm -hmm. to do? What would he try to do after that? And would it make it at all difficult that he killed, say, the janitor on his way in? And would that not raise uh, suspicions right. and stuff? You know, actually, speaking of idiot plots, I mean, one of the things that uh, I really wondered about with Terminator 2 is, like, why doesn't the T-1000 ever impersonate the Arnold Schwarzenegger robot? You know, the, the Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator, you know? Yeah, well, and I mean, speaking of like, why didn't you impersonate that guy? I mean, the the the, the one thing probably that drives me crazy the most in Terminator Two is where the the C one thousand is pursuing them out as they're escaping from the mental hospital, and he gets he sort of climbs up on the back of their car, and mm -hmm. Arnold Schwarzenegger blows one of his sort of claw things off, and he falls off the car, and there's just just this little tip of claw left, kind of stuck mm -hmm. in the trunk, and John Connor reaches out and grabs it and throws it off into the street. Mm -hmm. You know, which is the absolute stupidest thing you could possibly do in this situation because yeah. it's been established that, that the T-1000 can impersonate anything that it's touched. Mm -hmm. And right. so when he touches it right there, now it can impersonate him. Mm -hmm. But then that never That's comes up in the movie. Although actually on that same note, you know, as far as, you know, like touching what you, you know, like impersonating what you can touch and, 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 what, and all that. Like, okay, so say you accept that notion, right? So I, I'm not actually clear, like, you know, why did, uh, why did the T-1000 like have to... Um, like kill somebody to take his clothes because like, so he kills the first cop to take his clothes or maybe, maybe, maybe he doesn't actually take them. Uh, and maybe he just impersonates the clothes all along, but it's just like, it seems like every other point during the movie, he never has to be naked. He's always impersonating the clothes as well as the person. Um, but then like, I also don't understand, like, why does he always keep turning into Robert Patrick? You know, like, why doesn't he, why doesn't he always look like somebody else? It's like, once they've identified the Robert Patrick guy as the Terminator, Shouldn't he always like? Ne shouldn't he like never use that face again? Because then that's just gonna be like, oh look, that's the Terminator. We recognize that guy. If he's somebody else every time, they're not even gonna know he's coming until it's too late. I mean, the issue of like, but he he shows up naked, mm -hmm. you know, at the beginning because it's been established that only living tissue can travel through time. Right. Um, but then it it doesn't seem like he's made out of living tissue at all, right? Isn't he made completely out of some yeah. sort of you know nano steel 
Yeah, he's some kind of liquid metal, yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. Yeah, because like the the original Terminator, it's explained away because you know he's a, he's like a cyborg type. It's like you know he's a he's a robot, but his his robot skeleton is covered with, it, with living tissue, so that he looks like it looks like a human. Um, and so like he basically has like he has actual like human skin over top of a, a robot skeleton. Uh, but yeah, with the with the T one thousand, that's yeah, it's that, that's not addressed really because like how could that be living tissue? But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Um, I mean, I mean, trying to explain that robot scientifically is probably going to be a losing proposition no matter what you do. I mean, because it, you know, as cool as the idea is, it seems really questionable that that's possible. That would be ever that that, that would be ever, ever be possible. Well, I don't know. I mean, they have these robots they're working on that are sort of swarm things, you know, and they form into shapes. So, I mean, mm. I could kind of I could see it, you know, that that's not the <laughs> that's not one of the biggest things that bugs me. Like, you know, mm. um, oh, on, on the subject, but on, but on the subject of. You know, any you know, okay, you can send a robot back in time if it's surrounded by living tissue. It just makes me wonder why don't they, you know, feed a laser gun to a cow or something mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. send it back in time and then mm -hmm. you'd have a laser gun. I mean, probably they don't have any cows, but I mean, there mm -hmm. must be something, <laughs> you know, put a grenade in a chicken. I don't know what kind of animals they well, have. Well, look, I mean, you don't even you don't need to even need to be that elaborate. Put a fucking compartment in the stomach of the Terminator and then just have them cut open their stomach and reach in and grab it. Oh, well, I'm actually you all that. No, that's a good point. But I'm actually talking about uh, oh, from the, the, the perspective the of the first Terminator, you know, oh, when oh. you're sending a human, you're sending a human back and you want yeah, him, right. you want him to have a laser gun. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that goes back to the idea that um, we have to assume that it must take a lot of energy or resources or whatever to actually send somebody back in time. And the resistance, um, you know, between the two of them, like, you know, Skynet has probably unlimited resources and can do whatever it wants versus uh, the resistance uh, would have very limited resources and probably limited access to the time travel technology. And so, you know, and also pro they didn't have any cows. But, um, <laughs> You know, I mean, it doesn't even need to be a cow necessarily. I mean, uh, and uh, although, yeah, I guess it would have to be something pretty big in order for it to be able to, you know, have the the weapon inside of it and still be living and not be dead tissue. Although, actually, speaking of Skynet and like, you know, theoretically having unlimited resources, being able to send back in time things as much as they want, you know, how come how come they only did it four times? I mean, you know, how come how come there's not a whole army of Terminators sent back to uh, to do the job? Well, yeah. Well, that's another thing is that they sort of they really hand wave that because in the first Terminator, it's established that they had built this time that Skynet had built this time machine and they had sent the Terminator back in time and then humans sent Kyle Reese back in time and then they blew up the time machine. Mm -hmm. um, but then in Terminator Two, there's like they had the machines had sent back another term is and that's totally hand waved. There's like no, I see. There's no explanation for how, where that fits into the continuity. Right. And then it happens again in Terminator mm -hmm. Three. So it's like, well, well, clearly, clearly they rebuilt the time machine at some point and then it didn't get destroyed after that or something. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you figure it has to be something like that. But I mean, the way it's explained in the first Terminator is that the machines had been defeated at this point. So, mm -hmm. you know, how are they building more time machines? I mean, this was their last ditch effort to, to win the war after they, you know, had oh. lost. Yeah, you're right. And they keep coming, you know, like, yeah, like when are they sending these other Terminators back and how do they, how come the Terminators keep getting better? You know? Yeah. Like. You know, when when is the when is the R and D for these new Terminators being done? Uh. Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, because you know, the thing is, like, so, I mean, if you can accept that they could have made the advance from the first Terminator to the to the T one thousand, like, okay, you can maybe understand that happening over the course of this war or whatever. But like, you know, yeah, yeah, like, how, I, I mean, how how much how much R and D time did they spend to then create the you know uh, this Terminator three version, uh, which is like, you know, that's a that's a huge upgrade over the t-1000 i mean if it can actually create guns out of its body and, and you know uh because that was the major that was the that was the thing that sort of kept it kept the t-1000 as a um you know sort of a, a foe that you could actually hope to fight against um is that you know it can only it, the only weapons it could form were like swords and stuff you know like hard objects you know i've always i mean I, i've always thought the tx was extremely lame and i mean you know, for, for some of the reasons you're saying, and just it just seems like such a lack of imagination. You know, like the the T eight hundred is different from the T one thousand, and then the T X is just kind of like, ah, we couldn't come up with anything new, so we just took some stuff from the previous movies and kind of mixed it together. And that's that's sort of the whole movie is kind of like that. You know, it's mm -hmm. like they, there's no origin original thinking to it at all. It's just sort of mm -hmm. like a when I watched it, it really sort of struck me as like a fan. It almost felt like a fan project. You know, <laughs> like. Mm -hmm. 
like we're fans of the originals and we're just going to like do it again, except make it not as good. And yeah, you know, and actually, uh, it was actually better than I remembered it. Um, like I, I remembered seeing Terminator three and it originally, and, and I didn't think much of it. I know. I, I, I mean, that's a lot, that's what I remembered. But then when I rewatched it, it was like, I don't know. It was a, it was, a, it was much better than I thought than I was remembering. Um, I mean, it was like, it was watchable. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't like want to turn it off as I was watching it. You know, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, it's not great, but it's, uh, you know, it's at least watchable. And I mean, and so was four actually. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was watchable anyway. I mean, I don't know that I was really too enthralled in it. And like I was saying, I, I found it very forgettable afterward, but, but you know, they're, they're at least, uh, they're not as bad as some other sequels. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll, I'll say for, for Termin- Terminator three, there were two things in that movie that I really liked. Um, John Connor is having this conversation with the Terminator and he says, you know, uh, how did it go exactly? I mean, well, uh, I think you, you're talking about like, uh, uh, he's saying, well, how come you're taking orders from Kate Brewster instead of me? Right, and right, it was yeah. like, because she sent me back in time, not you. And he said, well, why is that? It's because well, you were dead. Well, that, yeah. And then the Terminator says, well, I killed you, you know? Right. Right. And that's just, that's, that's really cr- sort of creepy and cool. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I thought that was I thought that was very cool. Um, although, like I was saying, you know, it's like it does raise some uh, issues uh, when you look at the you know canon of the the whole series. Like, well, how did Kyle Reese not recognize that thing then? If if you know that's if the Terminator models that is so prevalent that they keep reusing it. Well, and also if you know if Nick's you know if uh, if John Connor knows at this point that this model Terminator is going to kill him, you know, how does he not prevent it in the future? Or, right. I mean, I could see that still happening. I mean, you know, just knowing that somebody is going to kill you doesn't mean that you could avoid them your whole life, you know, I mean, or or, or not be surprised and, and whatnot. Um, although, you know, the Terminator does specifically say that, you know, they chose that model specifically because of John Connor's boyhood memories of, of the you know, of the Terminator saving him mm-hmm. and everything, you know. Like yeah, that it would sort of catch him off guard, but obviously it's not going to yeah. do that now. Right, um, right. But uh, that actually brings up a thing, going back to Terminator 2 for a second. When um, John Connor says, well, I want to go rescue my mom from the mental institution before she gets killed by the T-1000. And mm-hmm. the T-800 says, no, that's not the good, that's not the best, you know, that's that's not my, my mission is to protect you and this is going to be putting you in danger. Um, mm-hmm. Shouldn't John Connor have told the T-800 what was going to happen, right? Because in the right, future John Connor has memories of how he survived all this shit. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's at oh, least yeah. one. There's at least one template for a way that he can survive all this shit. Shouldn't he have told the T800 that? <laughs> you know, because like the way it, the way it shakes out is that he went to rescue his mom from the mental institution and it all went just fine. So, you know, isn't that information that T800 might, might want to know? Or I guess, <laughs> but then of course it didn't. I mean, you can you can sort of say, well, John Connor is constrained <laughs> to uh, contrive things to happen the way that he remembers them happening. And the way that they happened, the T-800 didn't have any directives along those lines, so therefore he can't give it any. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's just more weird time travel crap. Yeah, it's more paradox stuff that, you know, you can't, you can't figure a logical way out of that uh, dilemma. I guess there were just sort of two other things I wanted to mention um, in T-2, mm-hmm. uh, or I guess in the first two, in the first two movies. Um, one is that it seems like, right. but it, it still seems that just simply from a, tactical perspective that the terminator often results to violence in a, a counterproductive way you know mm-hmm. so like when he goes into the tech noir club the bouncer is like hey you didn't pay the cover charge and on a short Schwarzenegger like crushes the guy's hand mm-hmm. and uh you know it's like wouldn't it just be easier to just pay the guy eight bucks you know well uh, he probably doesn't have any money well, I don't know. He could have gotten some. I mean, he was in a gun store. Yo, yo, he sort of robbed a gun store earlier in the day. Yeah, you know, he should have, yeah he should I guess. I mean, he, yeah, I mean, it's it's probably just like you know they don't they they're assuming a certain level of stupidity of how um, you know he, that he doesn't understand how the culture works or whatever. But but the thing is, like, he does demonstrate a certain understanding of the culture in other aspects, right? So he should. You're right. He should be able to figure out money, and and he could have easily acquired some. But yeah, I mean, that that sort of reminds me of how, you know, um, when Arnold Schwarzenegger first appears, this is in, in Terminator, he, you know, uh, is accosted by these sort of uh, juvenile delinquents and, and kills them and takes their clothes. And, and one of them says, uh, fuck you, asshole. And then he sort of learns that line and, and throws it mm-hmm. back at the, the hotel owner later in the movie, uh, which I think is great. But uh, it does sort of make you wonder, like, don't people don't say fuck you, asshole in the future? Like, he's never, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's sort of the same thing with in Terminator 2, you know, John Connor teaches the robot about crying and stuff like that. And 
And that's always bugged me for, you know, for two reasons. One of which being that Kyle Reese in, in Terminator says, you know, these, these Terminators are, you know, impossible to distinguish from real people. Everything is the same. You know, they have sweat and bad mm-hmm. breath and tears. So it's established that they can cry. But then mm-hmm. in the second movie, they make it so that they can. Um, mm-hmm. But then the other thing is just like, yeah, what? He's never, you know, he doesn't know anything about crying, you know, or human emotion. Like, how, how could he possibly do his job? Or why was he mm-hmm. po- not programmed to understand even the most basic human emotions? Like, how was he supposed to be an effective assassin if he doesn't understand people crying and stuff like that? But uh, I don't know. I feel, I feel I, you know, I mean, I do I do absolutely love, you know, Terminator and Terminator 2. And I feel mm-hmm. like I'm, I'm, I'm just... Uh, Throwing out, throwing out a lot of criticism. So I'll say some some positive things uh, that I remember. Um, actually, something I thought was absolutely hilarious was uh, <laughs> uh, in a preview uh, for Terminator. You know, before Terminator 2 came out, they had sort of preview kind of, you know, like trailers and stuff and ads and things that came out. And one of them I remember, you know, they show all this mayhem. And then it ends with uh, just a shot of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he says, I swear I will not kill anyone. <laughs> Did you ever see that? Did you ever see that? I don't remember that. I mean, I remember the line in the movie, yeah, but I don't yeah. remember the trailer. Did you ever see that uh, Guns N' Roses music video uh, for Terminator 2? Oh, I'm sure I must have, but I don't remember it now. Uh, I mean, I, I remember now that you say that, I remember that they had a, they that they had like a song on the soundtrack or whatever, and that was like, you know, a big video that summer or whatever. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't remember no, that the song, the song was The song was You, you Could Be Mine. Um, but so, so in the music video, the Terminator is sent to a nightclub to assassinate Guns N' Roses. So, so he's, you know, he's moving through the crowd with his tar- targeting reticule and, you know, it's all red and stuff and he's scanning them and then he sort of confronts them. They're, they're leaving the club and he's standing in the alley and he confronts them and, you know, the tar- you know, it sort of mo- the target moves from band member to band member. And then it says, you know, sort of like um, target assessment, waste of ammo. <laughs> and he walks <laughs> off. Yeah. And, and if, I, only, if only he had managed to kill Axl Rose, then we might have been uh, uh, spared from Chinese democracy. <laughs> Man, when Terminator 2 came out, I mean, the special effects were just beyond anything you had ever seen before. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I just remember, I remember watching it the first time, and there's the part where, um, you know, the T-1000 is driving the truck, chasing John Connor, who's on his motorcycle, and, mm-hmm. um, you know, the T-800 con- contrives things so that the truck crashes and explodes in a giant ball of flame, and then then he and John drive off, and the T-1000 later walks out of the flames, and he's all silver, and... Mm-hmm. Um, and and I remember what I thought was, uh, well, uh, he looks pretty damaged. You know, he's got all his, you know, his outer layer of flesh melted off or something. Uh, and then he just reforms, you know, his whole, you know, human appearance. And the whole audience just gasped out loud hmm. at that part. I actually want to talk about, you know, one of my other really, um, like, sort of amazing Terminator 2 fond memories yeah. was uh, okay. it, it actually it, when they're escaping from the, the mental hospital, there's a scene where... The, uh, the 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 characters the heroes are all in an elevator and the T one thousand jumps on top of the elevator and it's sort of stabbing down through the roof of the elevator with its giant sword hand and the T eight hundred says to Sarah Connor and John get down and he starts shooting back at it and there's just a moment where Sarah Connor sort of glances at him and then she's just kind of like fuck this and she grabs a gun from his waistband and starts shooting herself and I remember just the whole audience just cheered at that part and uh, you know it was just uh, uh, it was much more rare in those days for a uh, for a sort of to have a sort of female action hero like mm-hmm. that, and so it was just really uh, really thrilling. Uh, I remember at that moment when that happened. Actually, you know, I, I listened to there. There's a podcast called Double Feature where they talk about movies, and they did one on Terminator. <laughs> and one of the guys has the, has this theory that I think is very memorable. Uh, but he says that in in Terminator, Sarah Connor is essentially a uh, sort of damsel in distress for almost mm-hmm. the entire movie, and then. Uh, at, at the end of the movie, she becomes more sort of a, a hero and, you know, uh, stronger and, you know, ends up being the one who finally terminates the Terminator at the end. <laughs> and and that the, the turning point for her character is the moment when uh, they're having sex, when, when Reese and, and Sarah Connor are having sex and she rolls over on top of him. Hmm. And, you know, when she's on top, <laughs> that that's sort of symbolic that that moment when she's on top uh, is the moment when her character starts being more assertive and uh, and stronger and stuff. I, I think that's sort of crackpot, but uh, huh. it's, kind of, that's, it's kind of funny. <laughs> that's, that's actually pretty clever. <laughs> that's a pretty clever interpretation. I think once upon a time, I promised to say something else I liked about Terminator 3. Um, huh. I don't think I ever got around to it. But the, the other thing I really liked about Terminator 3 was the ending where, mm-hmm. you know, because the whole movie, you're like, oh, yeah, they're going to like 
you know, they're going to kill the TX and everything's going to be fine again. And it's going to set up another movie where a Terminator comes back in time or something, you know? Mm -hmm. And then just at the end, they end up in that bunker and they're Mm -hmm. like, wait, how do we, how do we destroy Skynet or whatever? And it's like, no, there, there was never any chance of, you know, stopping, stopping this, you know, her dad just tricked them into going someplace where they would survive. And Mm -hmm. the movie just ends on this really like sort of grim note. So was there anything, was there anything you liked in Terminator Salvation? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, one of the things that uh, that occurred to me as I was watching the movie, watching that movie, and I was rewatching the others, is that um, I think one of the really smart things that they did in two and three was, uh, you know, and maybe in one, I don't remember if they do it in one, but you know, it's like just giving us these glimpses of the future, like that was really effective, I thought. But with the with the fourth movie being entirely set in that future, is like I think it was it demystified a lot of. Uh, of the mythology of like the Terminator franchise, you know, it's like, I think having only seen these glimpses, only having heard uh, bits and pieces about what it was like and, and all the details like that worked very effectively. But then when you have the whole movie set there and it's just right there in your face um, the whole time, I mean, um, I think that that can't help but be a little disappointing. Cause it's like, it's sort of like this legendary time that, that we've heard about. And then when you actually see what it's like, it's not it's not going to live up to that to that legend i mean like for instance like you know everything we've heard about camelot like if we actually saw what camelot was like we'd probably be a little disappointed right so um that's your answer to the question was there anything you liked about it no no i guess it wasn't (laughs) um uh let's see well um i'm gonna gonna have to think about this for a little (laughs) while all right. Well, I, I, I'm going to actually pick up and, and, and agree with you that the demystification is a big problem I have with, with <laughs> Terminator 3 and, and Terminator Salvation because, you know, John Connor, like in, in, in Terminator, you know, John Connor, you know, you just, you have to fill in with your imagination what John Connor is like. And, and I think it's more powerful that way. And in Terminator 2, uh, you know, you just get this glimpse of him as an adult at the beginning. Um, but it's still, he still comes across as this very mythological, you know, mm-hmm. or, you know, mythical, uh, character. And then you see him as a kid, but you can still, you know, the kid is young enough that you can still, he's still separate enough from the adults that his flaws aren't, uh, as grating as they would be. But, mm-hmm. you know, like when you get to Terminator three, when he's, I don't know, what is he like 22 or something in that movie? Or, mm-hmm. I just found him just like a wuss, you know? Yeah. Um, I just couldn't stand him. And, uh, you know, you're like this, you know, this guy is John Connor, really? Uh, yeah, it's harder to imagine him coming from what he is in Terminator 3 to being the man that we see in, in Terminator 4 and uh, and in the future scenes as well. And, and just what we know about him from, you know, legend or whatever. And then in Terminator 4, I just didn't, didn't like him that much. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I, I like Christian Bale usually, um, but he just he was just very, I don't know, he's just not, not very compelling to me. Yeah, so I mean, I, I just, you know, I think I think John Connor is a character who, you know, is better in our imagination than he is, you know, standing in front of the camera shouting stuff. I guess just the last thing I wanted, wanted to talk about was I read a review of the Terminator movies once that I thought was really interesting, but it was sort of, it was sort of this cri- sort of overall critique where it was kind of saying that the movies are sort of suspect in that they create a, uh, a sort of morality free zone. Uh, because it's established that John Connor is the only person whose survival matters. And he matters more than the rest of the human race put together. And so essentially anything that you do to protect him is justified. Mm. And so, I mean, if you see like, like in Terminator 2, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger drives around all over the place, causing all sorts of mayhem and traffic accidents and, Mm -hmm. you know, throwing people headfirst into walls and, you know, (laughs) whatever else. And, uh, and the, the the point of this review was kind of that, you know, there, there's just something a little bit odd about sort of reveling in a story that creates this sort of uh, consequences for free ends justifies the means sort of world. Uh, I mean, I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, you know, I don't know that it's saying that it's a, a morality free uh, situation. I mean, you know... Um... I mean, sure, uh, you know, like you say, I mean, there's probably people that must have got killed uh, during all of this, and, and certainly people got injured, and, and, you know, there were car accidents and everything. But, you know, I mean, once things are in motion, there, there's only so much that you can do about it, you know? And, I mean, it's like, and in every action movie, you know, there's a hero who 
who who is who has some sort of goal that he has to accomplish and i mean in the course of the movie he probably you know there are going to be other sort of collateral damage that's going to happen just you know not because uh not anything intentional on his part but just in the pursuit of his goal and 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 you know i mean that's not to say that that they get a free pass for uh for all the damage or or possible deaths that they cause but i mean you know it's just it's, it's sort of a byproduct of of, of of any sort of uh you know mission like that and and i mean i don't i don't know that it just the fact that that there's that there's time travel involved in this and that john connor is like so important i don't know that that itself or i don't know that that gives them any more of a morality like a, a get out of morality jail free card than uh you know than any other action hero i mean but if you think about batman or some other sort of action hero um mm-hmm. there's not sort of the same sort of thing i mean you know i mean like like batman has to balance you know, saving Robin or whatever against, Mm. you know, the civilian, the possible civilian casualties. But it seems that Terminator does create sort of a situation in which the balance is so skewed in favor of protecting John Connor that everyone else does sort of literally fade to insignificance. You know, that Mm -hmm. if you had to nuke an entire city to save John Connor, Mm -hmm. that would be (laughs) the only, the only possible option. Uh, all right, but yeah, so I mean, we're we're way over time here, so we got to wrap this up. But you know, if uh, anyone has any uh, opinions on that, uh, you know, please post a comment. Uh, and if you just want to post a comment about anything that we talked about today, uh, you can do that by going to our website at geeksguideshow.com and finding episode forty-one uh, with uh, Daniel H. Wilson. And if you click the link there, it'll take you to io9.com, and you can post a comment there. And as always, we're sponsored by Audible.com. And so if you go to our website at geeksguideshow.com and click on any of the ads for Audible, it'll take you to a page where you can sign up for a free trial membership and uh, receive a free audiobook. And of course, one free audiobook you might want to check out is Robopocalypse by Daniel H. Wilson that we talked about on the show today. Um, and if you you know sign up for one of those free trials there, uh, it'll uh, help us out, uh, help fund uh, future episodes of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And, of course, uh, as always, uh, if you want to support us in another way, you can go to iTunes, uh, find Geek's Guide to the Galaxy there, and, and leave a comment or a rating, or both. And uh, also, like Dave was saying earlier, you go to io9 and leave comments on our episodes because that lets them know that you love us. And also, uh, spread the word. Tell a friend about the show. Um, so that was our episode, and thanks for listening. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of io9. For this episode's show notes, to subscribe to this podcast, or for more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your hosts, visit johnjosephadams.com or davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by Slipgate 9 Entertainment. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.